could have anyone dead or alive, who would it be? Ooh, Ella Fitzgerald. Ooh. Without question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, man. I was really, really sad the day she died, but I, I'm very thankful that I did get an opportunity to see her uh, perform uh, before she died. It was in San Francisco, and she was blind, couldn't walk. They wheeled her out, set her on a stool, and her voice was like a bell, crystal clear. I mean, wow. She just sang her heart out. I was just like, man. And who's, the, who's your favorite that you've heard about so far? Um, Laurel Holloman. Oh, God. <laughs> It's true. <laughs> it's true. No. No, 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 no. No, um, no you're, you actually are one of my favorites. You actually are one of my favorites. No, I still haven't on, done, no. No, 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 no. no, I still Stop. haven't done really great work with you yet. Yeah. But, um, because I hate getting my pictures. Yeah, that's, that's basically your reason. Well, you know, I, they're, I hate it. No, you did. Oh, come on. <laughs> um, but, geez. Um, probably just unknown people I see on the streets during my travels. Uh -huh. Yeah, um, those are always the best shots to me. I was in St. Lucia um, in the spring and ran into a guy sitting um, like on the dock and he reminded me so much of my father. And you know, it's kind of tricky with the uh, Caribbean people particularly because they don't like to get their pictures taken just randomly in most cases. And so I, I attached the zoom lens and stood back about 10 feet and you know, not he capture, still saw me. Not to capture his soul. Yeah, yeah, but he still saw me and he looked into the camera, but it was just this great look and it reminded me so much of my dad. And, uh, well, tell yeah. me about your dad for a second, because the funny thing was is that my mom had... Oh, yeah, him. yeah. And he was interviewed on NPR. Yeah, that was funny and because I had just come back from his funeral and ran into you and your mom on the street. Uh -huh. And, uh, yeah, she saw or heard that interview he did with my brother on NPR uh, StoryCorps. And uh, basically, oh, um, what? Oh, okay. Well, basically, yeah. I'm, I'm getting here. Okay. Um, basically, he was a. I love uh, this. I'm interviewing you. I know. I know. <laughs> See, I hit new contract. Um, he was a Pullman Porter back in the '40s and early '50s before I was born, and um, essentially uh, saw. I mean, went to every state in the nation you know, uh, in his travels and had, uh, had President Roosevelt on one of his cars, um, a lot of famous baseball mm -hmm. players, um, a lot of Negro League guys and uh, other dig dignitaries, which she didn't tell us about until, you wow. know, his final days really. It was just how, um, how old was he when he did the NPR interview? Uh, he would have been 92. Wow. So it was two years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, he'd been, he had been honored by what is now Amtrak. Um, they brought in a bunch of the old Pullman porters to uh, D.C., San Francisco, Chicago. He went to the Chicago event and became this media darling. Literally, I mean, people were calling our house all the time, asking for interviews, Good Morning America, all the local stations. Um, you know, this woman did a book. And it all kind of started um, because we got that initial call about the awards because I did a story, uh, Showtime, your old network, did this movie called 10,000 Men Named George with Andre Brown. Mm -hmm which was about the Pullman Porters, and I, in my review of that film, I mentioned that my dad was one, and this guy from Boston rang me up like two weeks later and said, hey, I'm doing a book, you know, so dad became this, you know, tremendous media personality, and, you know, I was so happy for him because, I mean, I think he was, well, I know he was the kind of guy who never felt that he, you know, lived up to his full potential, and it was because of the times. Yeah. And, um, you know, for him to get all that kind of, uh, all those accolades, you know, that late exactly. life was, yeah. yeah, very nice for him, so. Can you both explain what qualities you find in one another that has enabled your friendship to grow? Um, gee, what do I like about you? I like your hair. I shut up. I, I can do like this really fast. Really. <laughs>
two thirds of the way done. And this lady and right here is in it. And um, which is amazing because it was amazing. Yeah, I just it's blown away by everybody that you talked to. Yeah, but yeah. What's the core foundation of the book? Um, it actually started because I did a story about six, seven years ago on um, how different cultures of women approach aging. And I started that story because a lot of my friends, um, particularly my white friends, were starting to panic about getting older. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, this changes a lot, a lot. More, more than it does for us. <laughs> um, and it's the melanin. That's not to say black women don't, you know, fret about getting older. They do, but in a different way. Um, so, you know, it's just curious to me because, you know, I think aging naturally is beautiful. I mean, when you look at oh, yeah. some of you know some of the actresses uh, that have allowed themselves to do that, I think they're just gorgeous. Yeah. Um, so that's kind of where it started, and then um, I was working at ESPN, and you know my show got canceled, and I said, oh, I got to find something to do, and then this like, idea came to me, and um, I did a little work on it, and then I put it down because I got busy with other things, but then it came back, and uh, it's been really, really well received by. Everybody that's involved, you know, the celebrities that are involved, and just you know, plain folks that are involved, and all that. So it's oh, what I'm. What's uh, not just about age? What, what, what's your theory on like what happens to women like I think, 35? That's kind yeah, of like, like well, you know, coming into your own, or yeah. I mean, those were the questions I was asking. Yeah. When did you first really love yourself? So, yeah. yeah. I figure it starts to happen around 36, um, between yeah. 36 and 40. Right. Women really start to kind of come into their own and feel comfortable in their skin and yeah. not give a damn right. anymore. Which so, was right, which was pretty close to what, yeah. what did I interact? That was when I was pregnant. Yeah, yeah, that, that's um, when you fell in love with yourself and you were pregnant on the show when... and you were like in those ugly granny pants. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> <laughs> Sitting at the season two premiere and right. next to Bob Greenblatt. I was like, <laughs> and oh. like the worst. <laughs> and then I show up on screen and like, full pregnancy. In fact, we shot it at four months and they said I didn't look pregnant enough. See, and I, I was farther along in the car. Yeah, and then we yeah. reshot it at six when I was really huge. And yeah. Dan Mahan, who was an amazing director, um, uh, just said, go, just drop your vanity. And I was like, drop my vanity, I already <laughs> dropped it. <laughs> it's like way, it's way out the door. Yeah. And, and I remember but, that scene. And then I just said, one yeah, everybody. Because <laughs> I'm like, no way. This, That's how big it gets. Yeah, no way this girl will get now. But there you were. I just felt like there was like a, you know, a barrier to break in television. But you um, never look more glowing. I mean, you look, yeah. you glowed that entire season. You really did. I don't watch much of season two. Oh, I don't watch it hardly anything. But, um, no, that was to answer, that was when I, there's like a big self acceptance in that. Okay. Because start to like not focus on all of those things that right. it's really hard for an actor on television to focus on. Right. Especially especially on our show, which had a just big gloss of gloss over glamour added to it right. to kind of pump it up. Um, and so in a way it was like, I guess really lovely to just accept myself and accept right. that 